this guy was arguing in like the article that I read. He was like, yeah, Jordan's the best offensive player. And I can see an argument for him being the best defensive player, but is he the best player? <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me of how we, uh, we laughed. We were talking off air about uh, Jeter's 2009, how yeah. the voters voted him. They gave him the Hank Aaron award. So they said, you're the best hitter in baseball. Yeah. And they voted him gold glove. You got a gold glove. Yeah. So he's the best defensive player at the most important defensive important position. Important position. Yeah. But then they gave Justin Moore, no, the MVP. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> This is Hot Hand Theory. This is a podcast where we talk about the NBA and break things down from an analytical perspective. I'm your co-host, XJ. As always, he is my brilliant co-host, Jeff. Jeff, we have so much to talk about, uh, especially in the Knicks universe. We're coming off a game where the Knicks played with a starting lineup with an average height under six foot five versus the Golden <laughs> State Warriors, which is incredible that I even just said those words. Jalen Brunson has been playing like a superstar. Mitchell Robinson may be coming back soon and coming off the bench. Where do you want to start, Jeff? Where should we start with talking about our Knicks talk? Dude, when is somebody just going to hire you? What a promo. What a, what a, what a, just all the hype, all the, I, I don't know how to match that. I mean, you just nailed it perfectly. What else is there to even talk about? Well, no one can um, hire me. I, I have a job and it's working for the Hot Hand Theory podcast, the biggest right. and the fastest growing data focused NBA podcast in the world. And I just made that up, but I think it's probably true. Yeah, see, even that though, that's some professional shit right there. Like people need to get and people need to get on it and start appreciating that. Um, I thought you nailed it. I thought I mean there's just the Knicks are in a really good place right now. I can't believe like when the when the when the road trip started and the Knicks had four straight games um at Portland, at uh Sacramento, at Golden State, and then at Denver tomorrow night, uh, or tonight when people are going to be hearing this. I mean, OG was back, and I don't know about you, but I would have signed for two and two. That's how I felt. I was just like, get out of here with two wins. They've guaranteed going three and one on this road trip. Jalen Brunson, after what you and I joked was one of the worst 40-point games we'd ever seen against Portland, <laughs> which was just yeah. so crazy to watch against a team that bad and him just playing in a certain way that just, I mean, it didn't matter because the team was so bad. Um there's probably something else from that game we should talk about or at least touch upon, but we can do that later. And then he backs it up with two games against the Kings um, and Warriors. I don't know about you, XJ, but those were two of the most impressive games that I had seen in a long time. Um, <sighs> Mike Brown said it after the game. The amount of attention that he's getting now is – it's like – it's honestly incomparable. I can't think of can, – can you think of anybody else in the league since prime Steph Curry who's a guard who's being covered the way he's being covered? I just did a thread about it for Strickland covering Brunson's entire game. They're having the guy at the point of attack pick him up at half court almost every single time down. If the Knicks try to set a screen, whether it's a wing screen or a big screen or even a guard-on-guard -guard screen – they're blitzing at the level. There's no there's no leveraging that screen for anything other than a, a slip pass. That's it. They are not letting Jalen Brunson use a screen and get downhill. So already Brunson's path to efficient scoring is is nuked. Like he's basically operating with one hand tied behind his back because he can't score out of the pick and roll unless he showcases even more immaculate skill. Like his bucket at the end of the half, the the, the first free throw he shot was an and one basket where Draymond Green fouled him with less than a minute left in the second quarter. And he had to he had to beat uh, Wiggins, I think, at the point of attack. He had Podzemski waiting for him to help at the nail, and he had Draymond Green pre-rotated in the paint. It was Brunson basically playing one-on-three, and he beat the guy at the point of attack. Podzemski made a mistake, didn't, didn't rotate over fast enough, and then he Euro-stepped past Draymond Green for the end one. That's the type of shit he has to do every single time down the court just to get a basket for himself. And he's still averaging 35 a game on 60% true shooting or whatever insane. Like that alone is some of the most impact you'll see as a scorer. But then he's not like what we've talked about with Luca or with Trey Young or with prime James Harden. 
He's not this guy who, when he's playing off the ball, he's just going to stand there and he's not going to shoot off the catch. He combines being this remarkably skilled player with the ball in his hands with being one of the best catch-and-shoot three-point shooters in the entire league, and he moves off the ball. He's not just shooting off standstill catch. He relocates to the corner, so he'll move to the top of the key when the defense calls for it. He is a great off-the-ball player insofar as a 6'1 guy who can't dunk can be a great off-the-ball player. He's doing all these things. And then he's also leveraging the attention he gets to create baskets and create advantageous opportunities for his teammates. This is one of the best offensive stretches I've ever seen. I, this might be heresy to some people. It's way better than anything I ever saw from Carmelo Anthony as a Nick. I can't remember the last time anyone was this good as a Nick on offense. Has anyone, has any Nick ever been this impactful as an offensive player? I can't, I mean... Patrick Ewing is an amazing Hall of Famer, but he was one of the best defenders that era had ever seen. He wasn't, I mean, Walt, Clyde Frazier? Like, <laughs> I wasn't alive to see that. Like, when was, how, this guy is insane. This is, we're, we're watching a truly special stretch right now. Yeah, you, you giving me all that credit, but that monologue was fire, dude. Like, I, <laughs> I totally agree with, with everything that you said. And <clears throat> it's really incredible that he's able to, do all of this with the attention that he's getting based on the limitations of his teammates. And I think that that's kind of what you were saying and alluding to is that the reason that teams are able to like blitz off of him, off of pick and rolls and, and pick him up full court is because of the teammates surrounding him have a ton of limitation. And I think that the, the thing to, to note about that is part of it, in my opinion, has to do with the lack of spacing. I think that that's just true. Like it would be a lot harder to play Brunson the way that teams have played him if the Knicks had like a true four out, for instance, let's say. But at the same time, I do think that that teams are going to probably want to live with whoever beating them, even if it's, uh, you know, good shooters beating them from three. Teams are going to probably make the decision that's like, yeah, we'll we'll just have to live with that because Brunson is so efficient when he gets to his spots. And there's not really a way that you can stop him consistently. Like you even said, even if you give him all this attention, he's still able to score efficiently. And in my opinion, it doesn't really make sense that he's had, you know, 34 point game and a 42 point game back to back against um, Golden State and Sacramento. Because I figured those games would be like high assist games. And he did have seven assists against uh, the Golden State. But potentially high assists or high hockey assist games because of the way that team, those teams were treating him. But he's still able to score. <laughs> like, it doesn't really make sense that he's still able to score. Most most players would just, like you said, you know, kind of leverage the attention they get to make better opportunities for their, their teammates. But he's doing that and he's still scoring himself. So what we're seeing from Brunson is just an incredible stretch, an incredible run. Um, all of the data that I care about and that we care about agrees with that impact data. You know, his offensive impact is going through the roof. Um, I think that he is, uh, currently seventh in offensive EPM right now. Um, you know, wedged in between a couple guys named Giannis Antetokounmpo and Steph Curry, <laughs> um, you know, just ahead of a, a, the, the Steph Curry that you alluded to. Um, and the only other guys that are ahead of him in terms of EPM. Tyrese Halliburton, who started off extremely hot, but has had a very, very poor March. SGA, who is an MVP candidate. Joel Embiid, who would have been an MVP candidate, but has only played 34 games this year. Nikola Jokic, who's an MVP candidate. And Luka Doncic, who's an MVP candidate. So with all that being said, if I'm talking about these guys being the company that he's in and, and, and LeBron, the other impact metric that is also very highly regarded, very much agrees with some of the the, the kind of company that that Jalen Brunson is in all that being said is Brunson in terms of what he's been able to do with the teammates that he has the limitations uh from the team that he has limited time with Julius Randle limited time with OG and Anobi consistency still being able to score still being able to lift his team to wins big wins against potentially playoff teams in Sacramento and Golden State and others is this guy an MVP candidate is this guy a true maybe fringe, but a true MVP candidate. And that's the question I, I would pose to you that we, we kind of discussed before we jumped on the pod. I think he has to be. I don't, I don't think there's, I mean, we can debate how high he is, but the, MV, the MVP ladder that NBA puts out each week is 10 players deep. So like, and by the way, he wasn't on the last one. He's going to be on the next one. He'll be on the next MVP ladder. 
And that would be, it would be a huge oversight. I mean, if you look at the ladder last time out, it had Sabonis on it. Like, I don't know what that is, by the way. I mean, you and I are, I think, more sympathetic to Sabonis than most are, but is like, what what is happening there? Like, how, like, <laughs> how, why is he, is he even more valuable than Fox on that team? I mean, whatever, we can, we can save that for a just, Kings conversation. But. Just to, to add to what you're saying, real quick, the NBA uh, MVP ladder, the current one is one Jokic, two SGA, three Giannis, four Luka, five Jason Tatum, six Sabonis, seven Kawhi, eight Durant, nine Anthony Davis, and 10 Devin Booker. Um, so just to just to be clear about <laughs> just to be clear about who's on the top ten. Why is Anthony Davis over LeBron? <laughs> what are they Listen, doing? <laughs> there's a lot that we could talk about with this list. Yeah. <laughs> the MVP ladder. Why doing? is Jason Tatum number five? Um, I, the Tatum it, the Tatum thing is crazy. And they're gonna. Th- what's funny? Like they're probably gonna win the championship this year too. And everyone's gonna be like, "See, told you, Tatum's an MVP." Like, well, I think that, that that's like working backwards from the conclusion, which is something that you and I talk about a lot. It's like, well, our conclusion is that teams can't win a championship without having a top three player in the world. They won the championship. Thusly, they must have a top three player in the world, which it's totally not true. There's no reason why a team can't win a championship without having a top three player in the world, especially if they're as stacked as the Boston Celtics top five to six players are and the way that they fit together cohesively with all the shooting that they have. It's a tremendous synergistic lineup. And it's like, if the only way we can explain it is that Tatum must be the MVP, that just is, is, is faulty logic in my opinion. It's, in, it's, it's outrageous. Um, and the thing that bothers me the most about it is how fans of those teams get so defensive and it's dude, we're paying your team a compliment. Like this yeah. is legitimately <laughs> one of the best teams we've ever seen yeah. from a, from a synergistic standpoint. This is, you got five players who, I mean, people laugh at this with Derek White, but obviously we believe it. You have five players that at certain points in their career were either all-stars or fringe all-stars. I think all should have been all-stars. All five of these guys should have been all-stars at certain points in their career. All are playing near the peak of their powers right now. And they flow together perfectly. There is nothing diminishing about these guys at all. They all elevate one another in certain ways, especially with how Jalen Brown is playing defense this season. This is as close to a perfect unit as you can get with a five with, with five really good players. And I don't know if it, if the Knicks had that, I wouldn't give a shit if the best player was viewed as an MVP <laughs> candidate or not. Like, give me that, yeah. give me that team. And I mean, to bring this back to Brunson, the the Knicks have been kind of the opposite. Like, the Knicks haven't had OG Ananobi. They haven't had Julius Randle. They haven't had Mitchell Robinson. They haven't. I mean, they they brought in Boyan and Alec Burks. Those guys haven't done anything. Uh, sans a, a few nice moments, but Brunson has had basically no help. He's at, he, they they've defended really well. Thibodeau Thibodeau is Thibodeau deserves all the flowers for the defense he has these guys playing. And I get I suppose. That needs to be factored in here. You know, the Knicks were – how high did they get this season, actually? They were, at one point, a top-five offense at least, right? Offensively? I think, yeah, for a little while, yeah. They were a top-five offense, and they were they were actually, you know, below average at defense at one point. Now they're barely average in offense. They're 14th in the NBA in overall offense, and they're, they've cracked the top 10 in defense, and that's all based on – what's been going on in the last month. So if you were a Jalen Brunson naysayer, at least relative to the MVP dis- discussion, I think it would be reasonable to bring up, well, why is this team still, you know, staying above water? Why, why is it, why is it able to tread water right now? Is it entirely because of Brunson or is it because the team is playing really good defense and that's helping them too? And I think that's a fair question. Um, what do you think about that extra? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you're making a great point just because the defense has been great and it's like, the exchange that's been able to be possible and it's only made possible because of Brunson is I'm Thibodeau. I'm just going to put my defensive players out there because we're going to just try to keep the teams to not score as much as we can. And hopefully we'll score enough. And the way that we're going to score enough. What are the two, what are the two examples you and I always talk about the, the 2001 Sixers with Allen Iverson and the 2011 Bulls coincidentally coached by Tom Thibodeau. Right. And I think that it went super extreme in one direction with analytics people who said 
Allen Iverson and Derrick Rose were known as offensive first guys, but those offenses weren't good. The defenses were what carried them. Yeah. Well, guess what? The reason the defense was allowed to carry them is because those two guys could carry, Absolutely. single-handedly turn them into passable enough offenses that their teams could win games surrounded by no offense players. You can't put four guys like friggin' Dikembe Mutombo, Aaron McKee, Eric Snow, and God, who was the power? Theo Ratliff. That was the starting lineup. <laughs> Theo Ratliff, Aaron McKee, Eric Snow, and Dikembe Mutombo. Those four guys... You put them with 95% of the league and they're winning 20 games. And I'm not saying Allen Iverson is worth 40 wins or whatever the Sixers won. I'm yeah. saying you need to make those four guys work. Yes, those four guys being elite at defense and creating elite defense matters. But you also need to be able to tread water on the other side of the ball. And that's what Allen Iverson was able to do for that team. That's what Derrick Rose did for the Bulls. And that's what Jalen Rose is doing for these Knicks. I'm sorry to cut you off, but. That's okay. You call him Jalen Rose, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep going though, because you call because <laughs> Jalen Rose would not be able to do this shit whatsoever. Jalen Rose, <laughs> very fun player. He would not have been able to do what Jalen Brunson's doing. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, it's it's. I mean, it's and it's, that's the point. That's the point we're making here, which is that this is only possible because you have Jalen Brunson. You you wouldn't be able to have such a great defense without having Jalen Brunson because you would have to sacrifice um, some defense for offense. And with Brunson, you don't have to. You can have an offense that stays afloat. In terms of um, EPM, uh, I mean, sorry, dunks in threes, offensive rating, uh, they adjust it by strength of schedule. The Knicks are 13th in the NBA. But then if you look at cleaning the glass, which filters out garbage time, the Knicks are 11th in offensive rating on the season and only a little bit, you know, decimal points behind the New Orleans, New Orleans Pelicans and the Atlanta uh, Hawks. So the fact that he's been able to essentially be a near top 10 offense, which is just contingent on Brunson being able to make things happen with a bunch of defenders around him. There aren't many players in the NBA who could do that. And that's, that's to me, that's what makes his case for MVP much stronger than that of a Jason Tatum, who MVP doesn't mean MVP means most valuable player. And you're not the most valuable player. If you're just like a contributor amongst a stacked group of, of, of offensive and defensive players, that does not make you the most valuable because we could imagine exchanging Jason Tatum out for another player and that team still being just as successful as they are. Imagine substituting Jalen Brunson out. I mean, we could, we could imagine guys who do a lot of the things that Jalen Brunson does like, um, you know, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, but would they be able to do it to that level that Jalen Brunson has done it with the circumstances? That's a big question. And the fact that he is doing it, we're not talking about it in a theoretical sense. Oh, could this guy do it? And we, you and I talk a lot of theory. This is not theory. This is reality. This is what's happening. And this is what he's done with the, the cohort that he's been given and the circumstances that he's received with having Mitchell Robinson out, having Julius Randle out, having OG Ananobi out. Three of the Knicks' best players and two of the Knicks' most important offensive pieces, potentially three of the Knicks' most important offensive pieces, and he's made this still a top, close to a top 10 offense in the NBA. That's completely incredible. And to me, um, you know, it also speaks to, I think, and this is the same, it's funny because you compared him to Steph Curry in that specific way that you were talking about with the attention that he's getting. But I think the other comparison to Curry is that people bring this up a lot about Curry, which is his conditioning. But nobody brings up the conditioning about Jalen Brunson. How is he able to do this? <laughs> I mean, he this is a stocky, smaller, stockier guy that we see on the court. He's not, he doesn't look like, he doesn't have the build of a Steph Curry where it's like he has 0% body fat and clearly all he does is run and do cardio all day. This is a shorter, stockier guy who's very strong, who is very low to the ground, um, who uses his strength against guys who are much bigger than him on both ends of the court. And this is a guy who's still able to do things where he like some of the plays where he's running around off ball that you mentioned earlier. It's like incredible. I'm like, how does he have the it seems like he's working harder off the ball in a lot of cases than he is on the ball. It's not like he's giving up the ball and then he's parked in the corner. The guy is running across the entire court, across baseline and back up around, a, you know, making a curl around the screen and then getting the ball and still trying to shoot a long distance pull up three like I, I, I don't know. It just seems incredible to me. And and I, I know we're biased in a way, not because we're Knicks fans, but because we watch all the Knicks games. So we're able to constantly see all of these nuanced things that Brunson does. And that gives us the bias of, wow, other teams, other teams, best players can't be doing all of this. This seems impossible. And honestly, 
there I'm sure there's a, a case that some of them are. I know that Jason Tatum's not, <laughs> not going to lie. I know that Jason Tatum's not for sure. Um, and I think that given the, the, the teammates that Kawhi has around him, that uh, obviously has two uh, still guys that are at the top of their game, superstar players, um, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker are both in this top 10 MVP ladder. Somehow. <laughs> I don't know how you could have two players who are both in the top t- 10 most valuable player conversations and be like a six seed in your conference that, that, that feels impossible, even though, you know, I'm not a person who looks at where the team is, is ranked, but when you have two guys that are at that level, I don't think you could be there. That that's, that's too much firepower. Then you have Anthony yeah, Davis and there and who and really have, shouldn't be there mean, over they, LeBron. They, they have, they have more good players too. It's not like and they have more good players. They have the best yeah. three point shooter in the NBA who who is a perfect ancillary piece the the perfect connector for them the best three point shooter the best spacer potentially in the entire league in Grayson Allen they have a guy who's one of the best rebounders in the league the best one of the best Lou players at the five position in terms of Yusuf Nurkic and and then when Bradley Beal's there you know another really good shooter and and a guy who can create as well like they have so many they have so many weapons it doesn't make sense for those guys to be up there Kawhi Leonard again you know Paul George could potentially be up there James Harden has fallen off a little bit but potentially could be up there Anthony Davis is there LeBron probably should be there instead so honestly if I was to rank it Jeff um I'd have for my MVP ballot right now I'd have Jokic I'd have SGA I'd probably have Luka I'd probably have Giannis and then I have Jalen Brunson then I have Jalen Brunson so uh what do you think that's what that's what my list would be too. I don't think he can. I don't think he can crack any of them. Um, this was a month ago. I think I I would have had Halliburton, but I think Brunson has. I think Halliburton just he's fallen off way too much in this important moment of the season, and they're almost treading water in spite of him. He's been that bad. Um, he's been so bad in March. Like I think he's won for like. 30 or something from three. I don't know. I don't know what the actual number is. It's something yeah, crazy. Like he's, I mean, if I, if I was a Pacers fan, look, I said this the other day, regression was always coming. It was just, it, you know, I thought you made a really interesting point on one of our first episodes when you said, when you talked about volatility and you talked about variance and we, we discussed, you know, how there's more variance than just shooting. There's variance in output. And you basically talked about how, it takes a while for you to believe something because it's just really hard to be good. So yeah. this wasn't even like, it, I didn't know where it was going to come from, but it just felt unlikely to me that Halliburton was going to remain the best offensive player in basketball. Like just because that's, that's such a huge leap. Um, it wasn't, he wasn't just performing impact wise as the best offensive player in basketball. He was performing impact wise as one of the best offensive players we've ever seen <laughs> to be right. clear. So that, yeah. that, that was not sustainable. Yeah, I, I won't say I wouldn't say that that where he's fallen was expected to me like he's shooting 17 percent from three in March. Guys go through like rough stretches and stuff, but like I don't think that that's like I would have expected him to completely fall off a cliff in terms of his efficiency or anything like that. I don't I don't think that was necessarily in the expectations. And so that's why I think there there, there there's other potential. For instance, you know, even just saying like he, he shot 40 or 41 percent the every year of his career besides this one, he's now shooting 36% because his shooting has completely fallen off a cliff. I don't think to me, that's like more um, than I would have expected based on variance. So I, I, I don't believe just as well as I wouldn't believe Halliburton is one of the best offensive players. in then, you know, in the history of basketball, I also don't believe he's as bad as, you know, he has been lately. Yes, I agree. But he has been bad lately, so... Yeah, yeah, but that's a reality. You're right. Yeah, that, that's that's the reality of the situation, and I don't think that you can put him ahead of Jalen Brunson in terms of impact this season or in terms of value to his team this season. Um, and you just look at the other guys who are close when you start studying other metrics, you know. Um, Embiid can't be in... We, we know Embiid isn't, isn't in the discussion. Uh, Steph... Missed some games. He's missed six games this season. The Warriors are the 10 seed, you know, like, and, and it it's not as simple as that. But look, I, I do think that, like, if you have two players whose impacts are pretty similar and one player, you could argue, is in a better team construct that, that is more conducive for them to be efficient and more conducive to them to be impactful, 
you should lean the other way already. And then you also have the team success. To me, I, I don't see how you can put Steph Curry above um, Jalen Brunson in terms of the MVP race for the 2023-2024 season, which is what we're talking about, to be clear. I think if you're a Warriors fan and you come on here, you, you stumble upon this episode for whatever reason, you're like, give me Steph Curry any day. Look, I'm happy as a Knicks fan that the Knicks are riding with Jalen Brunson, but I totally respect that opinion. Steph Curry, you won't find two non-Warriors fans higher on Steph Curry than the two guys sitting here talking. So, um, But it's it's an MVP discussion, and I, I think Jalen Brunson has to go ahead of him. Devin Booker, he's missed 14 games. I don't think you can put Devin Booker uh, ahead of – and actually I was talking about that. And on and on we go. There, there really aren't too many guys who – you can put ahead of Brunson. You just, you just can't do it. Um, I think fifth is a great spot for him. I, I wouldn't put him any higher, but I also wouldn't hold anything. You know, I wouldn't put anything past him either because there's still 14 games left in this season. That's a lot. That's, that's almost what 15% of the season or something. That's not nothing. Um, and if Brunson just keeps up this historic pace that he set the, at the start of this road trip, it's not, it's not, it's not insane for to for him to rise even higher, in my opinion. Rise even higher than fifth in the MVP race? Yeah, I don't. I, I'm just saying. I'm saying literally these last three games where he's averaging like forty points a game. Yeah, on a, an efficient thirty-eight points a game or whatever, and leading a team of look. I think that we've we've brag we not bragged we've boasted about the Knicks depth. I don't think he's in hell right now in terms of, I think he has good players around him. I think he has good defensive players around him. Um, There's enough shooting, especially with, we haven't even shouted out out yet. Well, he did at the top of the show, but especially with Tibbs going small against the Warriors. But at the same time, I mean, if the Knicks keep winning and Brunson keeps doing this, I don't know. I mean, do you, do you think it's just impossible to, to place him ahead of Luca or Giannis? Um, yeah, it, it would be tough for him to catch Luca or Giannis. I mean, if he continues to play that the way that he has, yes. I, I guess what I'm struggling with is like imagining him continuing to play the way that he has for yeah. like 10 games. Yeah. I, if that happened, then yeah, yeah. He could probably get as high as third if that's the case, but that would be incredible if he was able to like, it just, it doesn't seem sustainable to me given the the cast and given again, you know, we talked about the conditioning we talked about the way that teams are playing him. It's just like, dude, if he could continue doing that, then I don't know if he does it for the rest of the season, maybe he's squarely in the actual MVP race of like, who's going to win it, you know, but I just don't see that as like something that's reasonable to, to project happening. Yeah. I, I, of course I agree with that too. I, I have an admission for you, XJ. I, I hope that, the rest of the season starts Saturday. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that I hope that every, I hope that at least Hart, DiVincenzo, Hardenstein, and Brunson just take the trip home to New York. I hope they're already oh, in New York I right see. now. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear that. So do you feel like they just don't stand a chance against Denver? So why, why deal with it? You know, why, why put the additional wear and tear? Why, why have Josh Hart play 48 minutes again? Um, why have Brunson play a hard, hard 40 minutes or wherever it is that he plays? Is that what you're suggesting or what are you thinking? That is exactly what I'm suggesting. I don't think it's impossible they win this game, but I do think that the odds are low enough that the the rest and look, they play one they, they played Monday night in Golden State. If they had planned for this, well, no, forget forget playing for this because they could because I wouldn't feel this way had they lost at Golden State. I, I would understand wanting to feel like they need another win. The Golden State three, win allows this perspective essentially. It does it does it does free it up. So you get the win in Golden State. I do feel like there's a ton of merit to just being like, go back to New York now, rest for three days, get 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 go see a trainer, you know, go, go do what you got to do, um, as opposed to traveling to Denver playing in the high atmosphere altitude, playing, as you suggested, a really, really intense 35 to 40 minutes where anything could happen. Maybe I'm, maybe I have a PTSD because Denver was it Denver or Utah where RJ got hurt a couple seasons ago. Regardless. um, I think it was Denver. Regardless. Yeah. (laughs) We're not going to go, we're not going to go to me for the memory stuff. I mean, if you don't remember, then we could just forget about it. (laughs) Plus you're a hater. You've scrubbed all RJ from your, from your, from your. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that's accurate characterization, <laughs> correct? <laughs> um, I just I think it would have been wise for the team to not have those guys travel and to just just take the L. Sometimes that's okay, but. I also know when when it's tip off tomorrow night and our guys are on the court, I'll be like, "Fuck yeah, let's go, let's let's, let's steal another win," you know. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this: Is this game, if Brunson goes off and Jokic struggles, is this the time when when Brunson surpasses you? All right, no. All right, all right, fine, whatever. Um, I don't. Well, I, I, I look. I know that's not this part of the pod, but how close is Jokic versus SGA to you? Uh, I think that in my opinion, Jokic has kind of gained some distance in my opinion. Um, just because I think SGA's only argument has to be like, how good is his defensive impact? And it's really hard to parse out, I think. Um, and it's really hard to say that his defense has been good enough such that he can surpass what Jokic has done offensively. I think I think Jokic has been like clearly a better and more impactful offensive player than SGA, such that it would require him to be like this tremendous, incredible defensive player, which I know he's really good, but I'm not willing to say he's like elite enough on that end to surpass the the, the gap in, in offensive uh, impact. Yeah. Jokic is just so good. And it's 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 refreshing now that he's won a championship that we get to talk about how good he is. You know, like he's <laughs> proved it. He's proved that he can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so we can now retroactively go back and say he was good. Yeah, you couldn't say it before, but we could say it now. <laughs> we can talk. We can speak freely about how good Jokic is, and just like honestly, Jokic may be in terms of this last four year stretch where he should have, you know, if he continues it up like this year should have like four MVPs in a row. This is probably, and, and I'm not the biggest basketball historian, but like the most dominant offensive stretch in the history of the game, potentially. I mean, it has to at least be in the conversation. Yeah. I mean, relative to peers, I'd bet Jordan just was way better than everybody that I, I would just, I, I have nothing to back that up besides like counting stats and yeah, sure. my own memory, but like the start of his first three Pete and then going back to his 88 season is like one of the greatest seasons of all time. Um, 87, 88, he won, uh, he won defensive player of the year and then also averaged like 30, I don't know, some fucking insane box score stats. Like he, he averaged like 35 points a game on 61% true shooting. Yeah. It was just, yeah, he, I think that was the season he had like eight straight triple doubles. It was just, he yeah. was bananas. That So that that stretch is the height of his career on an individual standpoint. Um, I read an article that like a, a writer back then, it's funny because we always think about like, oh, like the people back then wouldn't have said what they're saying about LeBron now. But like before Jordan won a championship, we would have been the guys. Like they they were all like, well, can his style win? You know? Yeah, yeah. That's so funny that you say that. Yeah, we would have been like, dude, it doesn't matter if he's won a championship. Obviously, this guy is like the best offensive player that we've ever seen and right. most impactful offensive player that we've ever seen, regardless of his outcomes in the playoff crapshoot. I mean, it's not a crapshoot, but you know what I mean? Like in, yeah. in, this, in this small sample size theater, like we're not going to be, it's not going to be contingent on that. But yeah, that's but that's a good point. This guy, this guy was arguing in like the article that I read. He was like, yeah, Jordan's the best offensive player. And I can see an argument for him being the best defensive player, but is he the best player? <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me of how we uh, we laughed. We were talking off air about uh, Jeter's 2009, how yeah. the voters voted him. They gave him the Hank Aaron Award. So they said, you're the best hitter in baseball. Yeah, and they voted him Gold Glove. He got a Gold Glove. Yeah, so he's the best defensive player at the most important defensive important position. position. Yeah, but then they gave Justin Morneau the MVP. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like what the fuck. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah, that's. It's like yeah, you know what? You're the best player at the two ends of the game. But where are this other guy's more valuable than you? Clearly. <laughs> Are we what? sure Jordan impacts winning more than Isaiah Thomas? You know, like, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I don't know how these things go, but uh, <laughs> I do want to shift gears because somebody who's going to impact winning potentially is Mitchell Robinson. Potentially, potentially, Mitchell Robinson may impact winning. 
And if he does come back, it seems like there, there's some whispers, there's some murmurs that Mitchell Robinson's return could be, I wouldn't say around the corner, but like, I'll, I'll just say it seems uh, people feel a little bit more confident about Mitchell Robinson than even Julius Randle at this point is what it seems like, um, which, you know, sucks to say, but like, it, it does, it doesn't mean like there is some confidence around Mitch and, you know, we did see, um, a note from friend of the pod, Fred Katz, who uh, mentioned based on conversations today at practice today is what he said in his tweet. I'll say there's a strong probability Mitchell Robinson comes off the bench once he returns. I think that that's such an, uh, uh, an interesting note for a lot of reasons. One being, obviously, I've been hugely in favor of Isaiah Hardenstein being the full-time starter, whether Mitchell Robinson's been around or is, is back or not. You know, that's something I said as far back as in December, something I've thought as far back as when they first signed Isaiah Hardenstein. Um, so I, you know, I think that that's something that I, I, I appreciate the Knicks or whoever Fred is, is hearing this, com- these conversations from s- making this suggestion. But I also think that it's really interesting in terms of the Knicks trying to find offense with their second unit. This has been a conversation all year, essentially once they moved quickly, how can they find offense in the second unit? Do we need to get a Malcolm Brogdon? Do we need to get a Jordan Clarkson? Thank God they didn't get Jordan Clarkson. Um, that's been a conversation. But how did the Knicks get offense last year? Were they very efficient? Were they able to like generate really high percentage looks? Um, did they have really awesome offensive engines who were just able to kind of get whatever they wanted at the basket or wide open threes? No, the Knicks didn't shoot a very high percentage from effective field goal percentage standpoint. Um, I mean, they started to once they got Josh Hart, but overall in the season, they did it. The Knicks had a top three offense largely contingent on one Mitchell Robinson's ability to get offensive rebounds. The ability to get offensive rebounds, have extra chances, turn possessions into from from low effective, low efficiency possessions into effective possessions because they had one, two, three opportunities to score. Mitchell Robinson comes back and comes off the bench. Does Mitchell Robinson in such a weird roundabout way actually resolve the Knicks second unit offensive issues and dilemmas because he is able to score or he's able to help the Knicks score even despite being an inefficient second unit? The Knicks have shown that with Mitchell Robinson, they can still be effective despite being inefficient. And I just think it's such a weird and interesting wrinkle with Mitchell Robinson off the bench he may be the answer offensively for the Knicks, which is so weird to say, but I'm curious your thoughts on that. It's just a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Most people will think that like, Oh, we're shoring up the rim protection, you know, which they are. That's what, I mean, that's, I thought, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but Fred had a, a really cool story about Mitchell Robinson, not viewing himself as a shot blocker. I feel like that's, yeah. Uh, that's really symbolic of his evolution as a basketball player, especially to Knicks fans like us who were there in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, when there was nothing positive about the team, except for the few Mitchell Robinson minutes, like uh, because per minute, he was like a per minute darling. But if you think back to who Mitch was back then, and even the, the, the start of the, we here season, I, I think Thibodeau was, um, really helpful in getting him to see the the forest through the trees. Um, But if you think back to Mitch back then, he was leaping at everything and he doesn't do that anymore. He's, he's one of the most disciplined defenders in the entire NBA now. So the Knicks will be getting um, rim protection back, but to your point, they're also getting the league's best offensive rebounder in the entire NBA. And the thing is, is that so Hardenstein this season, um, his offensive rebound percentage is 15.1%. It's in the 98th percentile. That's really good. So when you think about replacing Mitchell Robinson with Isaiah Hardenstein, it's like, okay, he has the best defensive EPM in the, se- in the NBA this season still. Remarkable. So you're not losing that much on defense when you downgrade, or not downgrade, when you switch from Mitch to Hardenstein. He's, as I just alluded to, in the, at the top of the league in offensive rebound percentage. You're not losing that much on the offensive glass. Where you're making up for all of that is the bench minutes because as admirably as Precious Achua has played, he's not close to Hardenstein or Mitchell Robinson. 
Um, he's, I would say his best skill set is how switchable he is as a defender and his energy. He's great. Um, like he just, he never stops. The, the engine never stops. And at center, his lack of shooting doesn't hurt him as much. He's been really, really good at defense and offensive rebounding this season. He's in the 94th percentile on offensive rebound percentage, which is insane. And he's in the 82nd percentile on defensive EPM. It's still going to be a meaningful upgrade. Mitchell Robinson is just a different beast. You can almost say that the, the, especially when it comes to offensive rebounding, the numbers don't do it justice because it wasn't just, it's not, it's not just that he, he attacks the offensive glass and he puts the defenses in tough spots. He meaningfully affects other coaches' game plans in a way that Precious Achua and even Isaiah Hardenstein don't do. I mean, you heard Eric Spolster talk about it last season. Yes, they wanted to stop Jalen Brunson, but they were fine with Jalen Brunson scoring 40 points. Their game plan was to make sure that they won the possession battle and stop Mitchell Robinson from doing what he did against Cleveland. And I feel like Knicks fans are forgetting how important he was to everything that Knicks did last season. Now, I would have, and I think I did when you brought, when you first first brought it up, when you first were like, "Are we sure Arnson shouldn't be starting?" I would scoff at the idea. Would have scoffed at the idea at the beginning of the season that Arnson should supplant Mitch in the starting lineup because I just thought it was clear that Mitch was elite and is elite at what he's elite at, and that mattered in the starting lineup. But with Hardenstein's leap, I at least understand it. I, I at least understand if you believe that Hardenstein's leap is sustainable and is real, and you think we're going to be getting the Knicks are going to be getting these things, you're not trading off that much on the offensive glass or defense, and you're getting all of this gravity and passing that you just don't get. It's a pretty easy change. And that leaves these bench minutes. And to your point, I think the Knicks are just getting a huge upgrade. And something we talked about before we hopped on the pod, he's going to be playing a lot of backup bigs in these in these short shifts. You know, if he's playing 18 to 22 minutes a night and he doesn't have to, it, it's not like like Bam Adebayo is starting the game and he's starting against Hardenstein and then Bam comes out and Mitchell Robinson's taking on these backup bigs. Like what, what is Spolster going to do? Is he? Let's just say the Knicks played the Heat again and it was this version of Hardenstein playing this elite a level, attacking yeah. the offensive glass and defending like this, what what is supposed to do? Because and then you come off the bench and you bring in Mitch and then Kevin Love has to has to has to battle with Mitchell Robinson on the boards using his length. I mean Kevin Love's obviously an amazing one of the best rebounders ever, but Kevin Love is I don't know how old Kevin Love is now, but he he's not he's not the same guy he, he used to be. He was born in eighty eight, so he's thirty five or thirty six, I guess. Yeah, Kevin Love's not dealing with a fresh Mitchell Robinson off the bench <laughs> by where, where he's coming in to essentially like, Mitch, just go get all the rebounds. I'm sorry. That's not going to work out well for Kevin Love. It's not going to work out well for um, uh, uh, Chris on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, Chill but vibrant is his tag. Uh, made a comment to something I said. Goga Batazzi just woke up in a sweat. <laughs> Goga Batazzi is not battling a fresh Mitchell Robinson coming off the bench, just getting every rebound. Like, I'm sorry. All the backup bigs in the East are just not going to be able to deal with that. It's just not, they're just not going to. You know who, weirdly enough, would be not well suited? The Pacers? But no, the Cavs. Not, not because, uh, and, and, uh, and no, 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 just hear me out here. I'm okay, not saying they're I'll well listen. suited. I'll listen. I'll hear you out. I'll hear I'm you out. I'm not saying they're well suited, but. Because my point is, my point is, the rest of the East bench units are going to get so crushed. This is relative to that. Like, there's no one who's even close. No. Yeah. But the Cavs, with their new um, staggering of bigs, might actually be able to line up Jarrett Allen with the Mitchell Robinson bench unit bench minutes. Oh yeah, that's interesting. I thought you were going to say Evan Mobley at the five. I was like, yeah, it's no, just not going to no. work. I think, I think, yeah, I think no, they're going right. to try to stagger those two. And Bickerstaff is going to very quickly realize that Jared Allen needs to be out there for the Mitchell Robinson minutes. Yeah. And so the way he's going to stagger them is he's going to pull Allen early in the first and third quarter and then reinsert him for Mobley when Mitch comes off the bench late in the first. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, and, that's a really great point. Yeah, go ahead. And, I mean, if you go across the league and look at – 
like you just said, the Heat have Kevin Love. All right, next. Uh, the Bucks don't even – the Bucks have Bobby Portis. Bobby Portis is <laughs> big, but, I mean, good luck. No. Yeah. Uh, the Celtics, Al Horford. Next, you know, like, no, like not going to be able to fight. No, I mean, that's what I, I thought you were going to say the Pacers with like a Jalen Smith kind of Siakam, you know, tandem maybe could fight, you know, a little bit. I, I don't know. No, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't see that. I actually think Jared Allen as the starter who if you, if they're able to do their rotations like that would have the best chance. Um, And, that, and so that's all I was saying. Sure. I will say just so we don't come off as like irrational cocky Knicks fans. A couple of these guys we've mentioned, Kevin Love, Bobby Portis, Jalen Smith, Al Horford, while Mitchell Robinson will dispose of them on the offensive glass, they have their own ways of making Mitch pay on the other end of the court because they can yeah, shoot. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point for sure. I, I think that there's definitely a trade-off, and I'm glad you brought that up on the other end. Um, but I, I, at least the, the, the key insight to me is that this may help the second unit with their offensive struggles in particular. Um, still have to work things out on the other end. Just like you said, all those guys you mentioned are going to be able to space the floor. And we know that Mitch has trouble dealing with that. So there will, will be a give and take potentially, but I do think that this will help the Knicks at least with some of their offensive issues when Jalen Brunson's on the court. Um, and something else that, you know, may help the Knicks with their offensive issues. And that has is how good, Josh Hart and Deuce McBride has have been and and it was kind of this is kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about just for a little bit. Josh Hart, I think he's been incredible and it's not just the triple doubles. It's not just like the fact that he's getting the stats. It's he's just doing everything and in in such an inordinate number of minutes where it feels like impossible that he's been he should be able to do it. Um he hasn't been perfect in all these games where he's gotten like a lot of stats, but at the same time I really love Josh Hart pushing the ball in transition. And I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, but when Brunson's on the bench, when Josh Hart gets the rebound and just goes, I think that's the way that the Knicks can get really quick and instant offense and really deals with some of the, the ways that they, you know, they, they're not able to score in the half court when things get bogged down. And it's like, can we even get the ball in past the three point line? The Knicks are having always been able to get within the three point line on possessions when J- Jalen Brunson's on the game. But Josh Hart pushing in transition is an antidote to that. Deuce McBride's ability to hit mid-range shots, to hit pull-up shots, pull-up threes. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how sustainable it is. And this is something that you alluded to in terms of like variance and sustainability. I don't necessarily believe that Deuce McBride is this good <laughs> offensively, which would I, I mean the Golden State Warriors game, was he not? I'm it's arguable whether he was better or Brunson was better. Like that that is that is an argument you could have, in my opinion. Um, yeah. and so Legit, legitimate argument, yeah. a legitimate argument you could have, which who was better between those two. So I don't know. I, I definitely don't think that that's legit, but at the same time, Deuce McBride's been incredible. So I just wanted to give some love to those two guys. Yeah. And for people, you know, listening to this, you should really emphasize how meaningful it is for XJ to say that the guy with the sixth worst true shooting percentage in all of basketball among qualified players has been excellent lately. Yep. Like the guy, who, that out. <laughs> the guy who believes that in five years you won't be allowed to be in the NBA if you can't shoot. Threes. Hey, 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 10 years. Don't try to make my position look more ridiculous <laughs> than it already is. All right. Um, <laughs> like, let it be on its face what it is. <laughs> yeah. 10 years. My bad. My bad. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> So it, it's extremely meaningful because, look, Josh Hart was really good in the Warriors game. His lack of shooting hurts. Like, that, the, the reason, as you pointed out at the top of this pod, defenses can be as comfortable as they are playing the extreme aggressive style of defense they play is because they're just like, we can ignore Josh Hart. That's, that's what they do. And there are possessions where he doesn't shoot, and that hurts. And there are games when he does shoot and they don't go in and that hurts. Um, I, I just want to say real quick to that point because you mentioned the Warriors game. I thought it was so funny how they like looked around and they're like, damn, Precious is not here. How are we going to guard these guys? And then they just looked at Josh Hart and they were like, 
oh yeah we can <laughs> just do the same thing to you um they gave him so like they gave him so much space it was like kind of funny it was preposterous on certain possessions where like guys like draymond and stuff are just like they look over at him and like ah, go ahead buddy you got it do do whatever you got to do from there um yeah which is kind of crazy that you can do that but six from three i mean he was five for 12 from two that's not good like that's a, it's, it was it was. It has to be. Have been the best five for eighteen game in NBA history. I'd say. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Honestly, I'm not even gonna. And I just want to say real quick, Josh Hart's shooting. O of six from three in the Warriors game. O of two from three in the Sacramento game. O of two from three in the Portland game. One of six from three in the in the Philly game, and then one of seven from three in the previous Philly game. This is like. So two for his last twenty three. Good math. This is like untenable. This is like untenable. And, and, and I'm saying that after giving him credit, I'm saying in terms of like a playoff dynamic, you can't really have essentially at that point, you have to have a stretch five. And and you pointed out to me what the Rockets have done, um, you know, since Shingun has okay. been out where they have put um, Jabari Smith um, at the five and then let Thompson um, Amen Thompson just be the only non shooter out there, which allows you know a lot of different options and, and has created so much space on the court. Unless you're doing something like that with Josh Hart, you can't really have him and 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 Mitchell Robinson out there, or him and Isaiah Hardenstein out Hardenstein out there in the playoff dynamic because teams are going to really take advantage of that. So that that despite how well he played in the in the Warriors game and how impactful he was, I didn't think he was particularly useful or impactful in the Sacramento game. And I think that if his shooting continues like that, it's going to be hard for him to still have the kind of impact that we need, we would need from him in a playoff situation. Yeah. And that's the importance of OG Ananobi because I don't want to say that he renders Josh Hart moot, but I mean, Josh Hart is basically a better rebounding Swiss army knife, like OG Ananobi without the shooting. Um, and <sighs> I still, I have to say, I don't know if you share this fear. I still get worried that, you know, you put a gun to Tibbs' head in some, one of these playoff games, he's going to want to go Brunson, Hart, OG, and an OB, Randall, and a center. And I, I worry about that. But if my worries are um, unfounded and if they're proven untrue, Josh Hart's the odd man out, and he won't be playing meaningful enough minutes to really hurt the Knicks. I don't. I don't think that bench units um, ha- have the capacity to expose a non-shooter like Josh Hart playing with a non-shooting center in the way that like really smart on their toes starting units would. And I think that Josh Hart would find little creases of ways to impact both, like you brought up in his pushing the pace. But also in his cuts, he's a really good cutter. He find, He's a really good screener. You know, I did that thread on Hot Hand Theory uh, a week or so ago that did well. Awesome the Knicks thread. Are, the Knicks are seeking ways to try to leverage the fact that defenses don't care about his shooting. Um, and that's encouraging. But it's encouraging in a playoff series for 20 minutes a game, 25 minutes a game. It can't be... It's crunch time, and I need his rebounding. So we're gonna we're gonna forego Dante Divincenzo, Dante Divincenzo's shooting. That can't be. That can't be what happens. <laughs> I agree that that can't be what happens, and and honestly, that that is a concern. I'm not really thinking too much about it just yet, but it would be a concern if we got into that situation and that's what happened. But I'm gonna have some faith that you know Tibbs has been really good this year. I'm gonna have some faith that he's gonna recognize that Divincenzo out there gives them the best opportunity to win. And I'm thinking that he's at least thinking while OG is out, you know, while Randall is out, Josh Hart gives them a, a different edge, a different look that they may need to offset some of the, the the disadvantages that they have in terms of the talent gap on the offensive end. And, and, and hopefully that's the reason why he's playing so much and playing in these, in these situations where the Knicks could potentially have some better spacing. And I do appreciate the fact that, Josh Hart was out there instead of Precious Achua, even though they may be shooting a similar <laughs> percentage from three and teams will treat them similarly. I do think Josh Hart brings a different level of spacing and a different edge um, to the position in, instead of Precious Achua. So I, I appreciated that he was able to play. 
Yeah, he has more functional gravity, and he's also faster in his decisions and his processing, and he's faster yeah. at attacking closeouts. Or not not closeouts, but he's faster at knowing, I'm not going to shoot here, so I'll just dribble into the paint, and he's more effective. So these little margins are really, really valuable, and I think we saw it. Um, I'll be curious to see what Thibodeau does Thursday. I Look, I would be against it, and I know you would too. I just think the the spacing is too important. But if the Knicks were really trying to win the game, it wouldn't overly offend me if he went to pressure Sachua at power forward against specifically the Nuggets, just because they're such a big team. They're so big, yeah. It's 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 overwhelming, and and they they also have a non shooter in Aaron Gordon, and. To deal with Aaron Gordon, you really do have to keep him off the boards. You have to keep him off the boards. You have to keep him from getting lobs. In this specific situation, I would probably go Precious as well, honestly. Yeah. Um, it just the the other the other part of it is if you have Deuce out there and Deuce will guard Jamal Murray, which is good. Um, if you go down the line and you view that as the first domino who does Brunson even guard? You know, like, is he going to chase Contavious Caldwell Pope around despite the fact that he's running around on offense all the time? That's he's no going to have to chase KCP. I mean, there's no, uh, I, honestly, there's probably no other way around it. Who would he guard? Yeah, that's a good point. I guess he's guarding <laughs> KCP regardless. He's but still, I mean, KCP, yeah. Yeah. But then you, you know, you, you just, you still, then you have DiVincenzo on Michael Porter Jr. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a funny thought. I just I just pictured it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like so, Wembenyama standing it, next to uh, uh, Rudy Gobert. Right. I think <laughs> I think you'd rather have Divincenzo on Murray, and then yeah, you know, switch. And I do I think agree. look, you don't you don't want Brunson guarding Jamal Murray across an entire game. But if if Divincenzo and Brunson are kind of switchable, and Brunson, I think Brunson can hold his own um, in an on ball matchup like Jamal Murray. I think where he. Again, I don't think Brunson's a good defender, but I think his worst moments are when he kind of gets lost off the ball and he's asked to really lock in, and that's understandable because he's everything to this team's offense. Yep, I think that's spot on. I, I largely agree with everything you said. So really good Nick stuff coming up. I mean, we'll see about OG Ananobi's injury. We'll see about Julius Randle's injury and those guys return, but it'll be great to have Mitchell Robinson back and see how some of these pieces all fit together. Um, when a team that's getting a little bit more healthy and in a little into a little bit more of a rhythm as we get towards the postseason. 